everybody, and welcome to the fourth episode of 100 Years of the NFL, A Historical Journey. I am your host, Alex Chris. I hope all of you really enjoyed the 1964 Buffalo Bills and the 1968 New York Jets videos that I put on YouTube over the last few days. And, of course, I'd like to thank everybody who um, followed me for the uh, instant premiere a few nights ago of the 1968 New York Jets. Thank you for doing that. But here tonight, though, this is going to be a really special one here tonight as we're going to continue with the AFC East, and we're going to be talking about the 1972 Miami Dolphins, as many people know, as the only undefeated team in Super Bowl history. But really big thing about tonight, though, is I really want this episode to be a tribute to one of the greatest head coaches in NFL history in Don Shula who passed away almost a week ago and just an incredible man who still has the most wins of any head coach in NFL history so this special video tonight as well as the highlights that I will show you later in this video tonight just this is going to be a very special tribute to Don Shula and all he did to really resurrect Miami Dolphins offense that really started very bad in their first few years in the American Football League before transitioning when the NFL and AFL merged in 1970. So let's delve into the story a little bit here about this team. So similar though to the 1964 Bills and the 1968 Jets, the 72 Dolphins were also known for a really good defense as well, but they also had really good key pieces on offense as well. But back to what I said, though, is that when the Dolphins' 72 season, of course, it was a tremendous, perfect season that they did, but their story actually begins in 1970 when Don Shula arrived to basically reverse Miami's fortunes after a really disappointing four years in the American Football League from 1966 to 1969. So this was, you know, a really big project that Shula was bringing himself into when he arrived in Miami in 1970. So let's delve into this a little bit. So after winning only 15 games in their first four years of existence from 1966 to 1969 in the American Football League, the Dolphins hired Don Shula, who had coached the Baltimore Colts before coming to the Dolphins during that time. He They hired Shula as their second head coach, to replace George Wilson, who was the Dolphins' first head coach. They had hired him from the Detroit Lions after he had a successful tenure with them during the late 1950s and the early 1960s. But Shula, though, he arrived at a team, though, that only averaged almost about three, four wins a year in their first four years of existence in the AFL. But what's interesting here, though, is that before Shula ever came to Miami in 1970, the Dolphins had a director of player personnel named Joe Thomas, who really kind of worked general manager duties at the same time as well in Miami. He did a really good job really building a solid roster using the AFL and the NFL draft once the two leagues merged into the NFL draft in 1967. He did a really good job really just molding this team together in order for Shula then to process this team together in the right way to get them into the playoffs. And eventually Shula was even able to do that with a remarkable first year actually in um, in 1970, one of his his very first year, actually, Don Shula, he finished 10 and 4 that season after only after the Dolphins finished only 3 and 11 in 1969. So it was a great first year turnaround season in 1970. They made the playoffs but lost to the Oakland Raiders in their first playoff game. So 71, Shula comes back, same team, same philosophy. Miami repeats another 10 win season. They go 10 3 and 1 in 19. 19- 71, and they reached the AFC Championship game that year against Shula's um, former team, the Baltimore Colts. He beats them in the AFC Championship game, but then their journey really took a um, a major beating in Super Bowl VI when they faced the Dallas Cowboys, Roger Staubach and the crew, and they really just put up a 
beating on Miami in that game. Miami lost that one 24-3 in Super Bowl VI, and it was a really a humbling loss in many ways for a lot of Dolphins players, and it really served as a big wake-up call of saying, you know, just like, you know, this is how the NFL is going to be. You know, they're not going to be, you know, pushovers to these AFL teams that are now transitioning into the NFL. So Shula was really under a microscope. But then 1972, of course, you know, the story almost starts there. But before, though, um, we talk further, though, into the 1972 Dolphins um, schedule and how they um, accomplished so many great things during that perfect season in 1972. Let's single out um, a few really good players, both on the offensive side and the defensive side of the football um, from the Miami Dolphins. So let's start out with um, their offense. We'll talk about um, quarterback Bob Greasy to start with, actually, for the Dolphins here. He was um, one of Joe Thomas's first really big draft picks. He was the fourth overall pick in the 1967 NFL draft out of the University of Purdue, and he really molded into the Shula scheme very, very well in 1970 and 1971. I believe he was even talk about for even MVP balloting in 1971. He, of course, lost that, though, to um, Minnesota Vikings defensive lineman Alan Page that year. So it was a really um, great process for Greasy to go through under Don Schull in his first two years before being a, um, a pretty decent quarterback for the first few weeks of the Dolphins' season. But the Dolphins also had another quarterback that stepped in for um, – Greasy as well. His name was Earl Morrill, and what's interesting about Morrill is that he and um, Don Shula had a relationship when both of them were in Baltimore. He served as Shula's quarterback in 1968 and won NFL MVP honors that year with the Baltimore Colts while leading them to Super Bowl three. but then Shula, when he left to go to Miami, he really wanted Earl Morrill to almost serve as a backup role, and so he signed him in 1972, and I think Morrill just, he almost just, almost was relegated to the bench, and he just was seemed fine by that, but he played a really big role in the Dolphins' 72 season. We'll get to that a little bit later. One of their next um, offensive players was um, halfback Mercury Morris. He was another really good draft pick from um, Joe Thomas. He was a third-round pick in the 1969 NFL draft out of West Texas, a and M, and um, he really um, was in a really big race with um, O.J. Simpson, actually, who was a big target in the 1969 draft as well during that year. Um, but what's interesting, though, is that is that Mercury Morris he basically left college as one of the all-time leading rushers in the FBS that season. But then, you know, he really um, gelled together into a really good running back, even though in his first few years he really wasn't used much. But in 72, he was really used in a really big way. And, of course, we'll get to that later in our broadcast here. His fullback, Larry Zonka, a lot of people remember this name really well, Dolphins fans. He was the eighth overall pick in the 1968 NFL Draft out of the University of Syracuse. He was one of the um, early big-time names of um Syracuse football back in those days. A lot of people talk about John Mackey, Larry Zonka, kind of in that same class or era of Syracuse football, along with Floyd Little even a little bit as well. That really good drafts that Syracuse players eventually did have in the 1960s where they really dominated college football during those years. Um, and then um, one of um, the Dolphins' best wide receivers in 19. 72 also was wide receiver Paul Warfield. He was the 11th overall pick in the 1964 NFL Draft out of Ohio State, and he was drafted by the Cleveland Browns. He was a really big-time playmaker for um, the Cleveland Browns during his time. But then in 1970, the Dolphins really wanted to get a really big wide receiver weapon after having a really weak offensive receiving core in their first four years in the AFL. They traded um, for Paul Warfield to the Cleveland Browns, and they traded them a draft pick, which Cleveland then used to draft quarterback Mike Phipps from that they were able to um, snatch him from. But really the 
Dolphins really won that trade with Warfield really stepping up in his years that he did play with the Miami Dolphins. And also, um, the 72 Dolphins also had really two great offensive linemen as well that were really big in their 72 season. Right guard Larry Little, he was an undrafted free agent from Bethune-Cookman in 1967. He was signed um, by the San Diego Chargers in 19. 19- 67. Then he was traded to the Dolphins in 1969, and they really molded into one of the best offensive lines in during the 1970s, at least the early years during the 1970s decade. And his right tackle right beside him, Norm Evans, he was a 14th round pick by the Houston Oilers in 1965. He actually, um, excuse me, was drafted um, out of TCU during that. Um, draft there, but then he spent only one year though with Houston in 1965, and then he signed with the Dolphins in 1966. And just once again, another really big cog in that offensive line that the Dolphins had during that perfect season in 1972. And also, they had a really interesting offensive coordinator that served under Shula that year. His name was Howard Schellenberger. A lot of people remember this guy as being um, one of Bear Bryant's great coaches at the University of Alabama, and he was a really um, big-time talent for Joe Namath to even, you know, kind of process himself into getting um, the number one overall pick in 1965, but then he actually went to the NFL in 66. He actually served as another offensive assistant under George Allen with the Los Angeles Rams, and then he was signed by Miami in 1970, and he he, and he was a part of the staff for the Dolphins during their 72 perfect season, which he really molded a really good offense with the Dolphins that season. So, um, so that does it, though, for um, the key offensive players that the Dolphins had in um, 1972. We'll talk a little bit about their um, key defensive players now, actually. Lee, we'll start out with um, one of their best defensive ends on that team. His name was Bill Stanfill. He was the 11th overall pick in the 1969 NFL draft, and he was selected from Georgia that year. And he really was a big part of that no-name defense that the Dolphins were really known for in the early um, 1970s under Bill Arnsparger and all those guys. And we'll talk about Arnsparger in a little bit, actually. Um, A linebacker behind him, he was really um, the only Hall of Famer of that no-name defense. Nick Bonacani was the 13th. He was a 13th round pick in the 1962 AFL draft. He was drafted, actually, by the Boston Patriots that year out of Notre Dame and then he was traded to the Dolphins in 1969. So it was just a really good move there by Joe Thomas to really galvanize a really good Dolphins team before Shula got there in 1970 to really turn that whole team around. That Nick Bonacani trade was a really big one for some veteran leadership for that Miami Dolphins defense in 72. And they also had two really good safeties as well. They had a free safety named Jake Scott, who was the um, MVP, actually, in Super Bowl um, VII, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. But he was a seventh-round pick, though, in the 1970 NFL draft out of Georgia as well. So they drafted Stanfield in 69, and they drafted Jake Scott the next year in 1970, both them University of Georgia products and his... um, Safety right beside him, Dick Anderson. He was a third-round pick in the 1968 NFL Draft. He was drafted out of the University of Colorado, and he really helped out that Dolphins defense in a big way as well. He was a really good ball hawk. Um, Strong safety, even though free safeties are more ball hawks, but Dick Anderson also did a really good job intercepting passes as well. And, of course, I mentioned... um, earlier about Bill Arnsparger. He actually served as Shula's defensive assistant when um, both of them were in Baltimore. And then once Shula left Baltimore, Arnsparger then came with him. And he really 
help Shula in those early years, and then he actually came back to help Shula actually in the early 1980s. So he actually formed two defenses, actually. He formed the no-name defense in the early 70s, and then he ended up forming the Killer Bees defense in the 1980s. A lot of Dolphins will remember that unit perhaps as being almost maybe a little bit better than their no-name defense, but of course their no-name defense was the one that won them the two Super Bowls in 72 and 1973. And also that season, the Dolphins also had a really good kicker named Garrow Yepremi, and a lot of people remember this name, but a really interesting story though about Garrow Yepremi, and he actually did not attend American College. Actually, he was born in Cyprus, and he actually then emigrated to the United States in the early 1960s. His brother was um, was invited to Indiana University on a sco on a soccer scholarship, but Garrow, though he did not fit college football eligibility, but he decided to play football. He was actually signed by the Detroit Lions in 1966. He spent two years with them, and then he um, then played a few years in the Continental Football League for a few years, but then he was signed by Miami in 1970, and he was a really good kicker for them for a three-year period from 1971 to 1973. He did a really good job, really, with banging big field goals in big ways for the Dolphins during those seasons. The big news after the merger was the launching of expansion teams into southern cities. The AFL's new entry was in Miami, the home base of a young radio talk show host named Larry King. I worked at WIOD in Miami. I did a nightly radio show from Surfside 6, the houseboat that was a very famous television show. And they let us use that boat for our radio show. So we were docked opposite the Fontainebleau on the inland waterway. Many great guests would come, stay at the Fontainebleau and come across the street. And along come Danny Thomas and this group. And they bring the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins come to town. Amid all the bright lights and pretty girls that are synonymous with Miami, Florida, the American Football League kicks off the 1966 season, spotlighting its newest team, the Miami Dolphins. Danny was had maybe 1% of the team. Joe Robbie put the whole package together. I'd been enormously impressed uh, the entire time I'd been in Miami with the uh, enthusiasm of the football fan. Three of the top Joe was a genius of sorts. He had no money of his own. He once ran for governor of South Dakota, almost won. Very big in Democratic Party politics. Operating on a tight budget and with almost no lead time to assemble the team, the Dolphins scramble to publicize their new players while making the best of bad training camp facilities. St. Petersburg was not the place for a pro football team to train. They had no idea what was going on. We did not have a locker room. I don't know if we, we changed and did everything in our rooms. So after a couple of weeks in your room, it got a little bit gamey. We practiced on a field that was at one of the local junior highs or high school there, which was, I mean, had seashells on the field, and it wasn't even a football field. They just marked it off as like a part of a beach area almost. The playing surface at the Orange Bowl was a much faster track, as the Dolphins and their celebrity co-owner discovered the night of the first game in franchise history. Enjoying every moment of opening night is comedian Danny Thomas, co-owner along with Joseph Robbie. Looks like Danny knows his football. The Dolphins debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. Joe Hour from nearby Coral Gables High School and a Georgia Tech alumnus takes the opening kickoff and races 95 yards for a touchdown. Joe Hour took the opening kickoff and Danny Thomas ran down the sidelines with him. As he ran, Danny ran. Many years later, Johnny Carson asked him for his most memorable moment, and he said, well, the most memorable moment in his career uh, was when Joe Auer ran the opening kickoff of the Miami Dolphin franchise back for a touchdown. And God, I sat up in bed and went, did I just hear my name on the Johnny Carson show? The 66 Dolphins won just three games, and even those were witnessed by only a handful of Florida fans who stayed away from the Orange Bowl in droves, putting Miami's cash-strapped ownership 
in a deep financial hole. If certain players tell us in town here, and we hear from other people who've, who have done business all year with the Dolphins, that they've been waiting on the money that's owed them to this day. Yeah. Now, is that a rumor? There's never, been a, there's never been a player that hasn't been paid on time since this team went in business. I was sent to pick up the projector at the repair place, and I had to pay for it with my own money because they wouldn't let me. The Dolphins didn't have good enough credit. They wouldn't bill the Dolphins, and I had to pay for it with my own money. And uh, one time, the dry cleaners that cleaned our uniform held our uniforms up. Laundry was the least of Coach George Wilson's worries. When three of his quarterbacks were injured, he was forced to use the team punter, who also happened to be his son. George Wilson Jr. was a nice guy. He wasn't the picture athlete. He looked more like a uh, college professor or maybe one of the trainers or something. I mean, he didn't look like a football player. That was always the pressure was put on George Wilson's father about his son. His son was a good player, not a great player. Whenever he started his son, they lost. The fans would go nuts. Was George, the fans gave George a tough time. The press gave him a tough time. He started to drink, but he was a guy's guy. George Wilson was a real player coach. And I remember one time during training camp, we'd had a really bad practice, and he had us line up and started marching us around the playing field, you know, and I thought, God, I've never seen anything like this. He ended up marching us right into the uh, swimming pool at St. Andrews with our uniforms on and everything. And it ended up being, you know, one of these funny things that everybody just had a blast doing. Cooling off in the pool was a regular activity for Flipper, the team mascot in his end zone water tank. Being an expansion team, you needed a lot of things to perhaps draw people into it. And Flipper was very popular at that time. He would throw the footballs back out, you know, our field goals and extra points when it was going to the end zone. So Flipper was cool. Whenever the Dolphins score, Flipper would go up and jump through the hoop. They decided they didn't score enough, so he would jump up on first downs. We made a first down, flip the jump. Although points and victories were rare, the Dolphins reveled in being part of something new, just as the AFL's pioneers did when the league began. We were a bunch of cast-offs and rookies and people had, that were in the uh, twilight of their career all patched together in one place. We all were very cognizant of the fact that this may be our only or last chance. So it, it had a certain spirit and a certain friends and family feel to it that was very important and very memorable. Outside Dolphin Stadium, there's a statue commemorating Don Shula's perfect 1972 season. It depicts his ride of a lifetime when he was carried off after Super Bowl VII. Holding him up are offensive lineman Al Jenkins and Hall of Fame linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Honestly, I did not carry the coach off the field. Everybody accuses me of that, and I said, why would I want to put a fat Hungarian guy up on my shoulders after I play 60 minutes of one of the toughest games I've ever had to play in? There's no disagreement as to how bad the Dolphins were when Shula took over. They had won just three games in their last season under head coach George Wilson. Uh, it was a party team, and he referred to it when he got here. He says, I know you guys are used to having parties even when you lose, and we got to change this image. You guys don't know how to win, and I'm determined that we are going to teach you how to win. Hold up, hold up. What's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle. Let's go. He was the original Don, not just a Don, the Don. He was the head of organized violence, is what he was. Before, when it was too hot, the Dolphins went swimming. With Shula, there was no water on the field for seven years. They practiced four times a day, illegal in the NFL now, and lateness wasn't tolerated. A guy was late coming to practice, so the guy climbs over the fence, and he gets in, and, and, and she goes over to Shula, and Shula cuts him right there. And he says, and by the way, same way you came in, go back the same way. It was a fight every day for every one of us, and he never tired. You know, everybody said he was this, he was that. He was possessed. He was like some kind of evil spirit that had endless energy. Charlie, let's go. 
Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. The thing that uh, really is one of my coaching philosophies is uh, somehow, some way, get the winning edge in a ball game. That edge would come from hard work and Shula's infamous 12-minute runs after practice. They were a means to an end, and the players used any means to try and get out of them. I'm going to tell the truth now. From the time I passed out in practice, about two hours into practice, I started wheeling. I mean, this is the right time. I hit the ground, and the doctor told me, see, Larry, there's not a damn thing wrong with you. You got to find something. I said, well, doc, you see, you do have a slight sinus problem. I said, well, doc, put that on there. <laughs> I got you. What? I bull you. <laughs> All right, a little late on your read, Don. You're not going to have that much time. 33 zone? You, you didn't make the thing. He's a pusher. He's a guy that picks a goal. He looks at you and figures how far he can push you. Look at him! You can't come up unless he blocks! And he takes you right to that breaking point. Get set! What the hell are you doing? And sometimes a little beyond it. Sanka! Welcome back, everybody, to 100 Years of the NFL, A Historical Journey. I hope all of you really enjoyed those two videos that I was able to show you a little bit about the Miami Dolphins' early history of their days in the American Football League, as well as the NFL Films edition of A Football Life of Don Shula and his changing of the Dolphins culture when he got there in 1970. But right now we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of their key offensive statistics and we're also going to take a look at their schedule in 1972 that the Dolphins accomplished during their perfect season in that year. So let's talk a little bit about their um, key offensive and defensive statistics first. So we'll start out with their offense here a little bit. So the Miami Dolphins offense in 1972 was the number one ranked offense in the league that year. They were first overall in rushing that year. They rushed for 26 rushing touchdowns which led the league that year and they averaged 4.8 yards per carry across the running backs that they had that season as well. So a tremendous accomplishment that the Dolphins had for their offense that year, but they were 16th ranked, though, in the passing department, and we're going to touch on that a little bit later and just kind of figure why they were so weak on the passing side of the football, even though they were the number one ranked offense in the league that year in 1972, but also the 72 Dolphins also averaged 27.5 points per game that year and they actually only allowed 21 offensive sacks that year which was the sixth best in the National Football League that year and touching base on their quarterbacks as well Earl Morrill and Bob Greasy they combined to have the best passer rating across the entire NFL that year the Dolphins had an 86.9 passer rating that season in 1972 and they also did a really good job limiting the turnovers on offense as well. They only committed 28 turnovers in 1972, which was the fifth best in the league that year. They only threw 12 interceptions, and they only had 16 lost fumbles during that year as well. So it was a really good job by Miami's offense, really limiting their mistakes, but also really centralizing on the run and not putting too much pressure on both Earl Morrill and Bob Greasy to do everything. So it was a really good job by them, and their rushing attack also had a little bit of history as well as both Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka became the first duo in NFL history to rush for a 1,000 yards in a season as well. So really big accomplishments that the Dolphins were able to pull off in 1972 with their offense. But as good as their offense was, their defense was also perhaps one of the best in the NFL in the early 70s as well. In 1972, of course, the Dolphins, they had the number one ranked defense in the NFL that year as well, and they allowed the fewest first downs in the league as well, as well as the fewest total yards in the league that year in 72. They were fifth ranked in the passing department, and they were third in 
rushing defense as well that year. They only allowed 10 passing touchdowns and 8 rushing touchdowns all year. So only 18 offensive touchdowns they allowed the entire season. So a phenomenal job by Bill Arnsparger, really doing a fantastic job molding that no-name defense that year in 72. The Dolphins' defense also had 46 takeaways that year. That was the second best in the NFL that year. They had 26 interceptions and they had 20 fumble recoveries that year in 72. And their defensive line also played a big role as well as we talked about um, Bill Stanfill earlier in our broadcast. He led a defensive line unit that had 33 sacks that year, which was the ninth most in the NFL in 1972. They also did a really good job um, forcing quarterbacks to make mistakes that year as well. They only allowed a 47.4 passer rating to opposing quarterbacks, which was the second best in the NFL that year as well. And they only allowed 12.2 points across their 14 games during the 1972 season as well. And another big statistic as well for the Dolphins as well, they really limited the big plays that other teams really thrived on during those years in the 70s. It was really just trying to capitalize on big plays, but Miami's defense did another great job. They only allowed 4.3 yards per play that year in 1972 across their phenomenal defense, and that was the second best in the National Football League in 1972. So like I said, you know, just phenomenal job by both Bill Arnsparger, Don Shula, and Howard Schellenberger really, really doing a fantastic job forming perhaps the greatest team that pulled off a perfect season in 1972. Just a terrific job by all three of them doing their roles in Miami's phenomenal year in 1972. So um, so before, though, I show you some of their highlights, though, their 1972 season, I just want to go through on their schedule a little bit, and like I did with my other two broadcasts, I'm going to single out a few big um, performances during these individual weeks and what the Dolphins players accomplished during their season as well. So let's get started with this one here. So in week one of the 1972 season, the Dolphins went to play the Kansas City Chiefs, actually, that first game, and they won it by the final score of 20-10 to 10 in that game. And in this game, Bob Greasy threw for 111 yards and had a passing touchdown in the game. And also the Miami Dolphins' two big running backs I talked about earlier, Larry Zonka, and Mercury Morris. They combined for 185 yards rushing in that game, and Zonka also had a rushing touchdown in that Week 1 win over Kansas City. Week 2, the Dolphins played against the Houston Oilers in this game. This was a bigger blowout in this one. 34-13 to was the score in this game. This was another good day for Bob Greasy threw for 142 yards in this game and had another passing touchdown, but this was a really coming out party for Miami's fantastic rushing backfield, both Mercury Morris, Larry Zonka, and they had a third guy in there named Jim Kick. We're going to talk about him a little bit later when I um, go through their final statistics at the end of our broadcast, but both Kick, Morris, and Zonka, they combined for 228 yards rushing in this game and scored three rushing touchdowns. So phenomenal first game for them to really start gelling to what the Dolphins' offense was going to be like for that whole year in 1972. Week 3, the Dolphins played against the Minnesota Vikings in this game. Much tighter game in this one. Final score was 16-14 to in this game. Greasy had another exceptional game in this one. He threw for 127 yards passing in this game and had a passing touchdown as well. And the Miami's defense played a really big role in this game. They intercepted Fran Tarkenton on the Vikings three times in that game and did a really good job holding themselves together in a really close game. And it was really one of the few close games the Dolphins had in 1972. So after that win over Minnesota week four, the Dolphins went to play the New York Jets in this game. They won this one 27-17 was the score 
in this one. Greasy perhaps had his best game of the year that year. He threw for 220 yards in this game, had another passing touchdown in this game, and both Larry Zonka and Jim Kick in this game were the big running tandem in this game. They combined for 155 yards rushing in this game, and Jim Kick scored two rushing touchdowns in a big week four win for the Dolphins that year. Week five against the San Diego Chargers. The Dolphins won this one 24 to 10 in this one. Miami's backfield, as we said, Zonka, Morrison, Kick, they combined for 155 yards rushing in this game, and both Howard Twilley and Paul Warfield also had two receiving touchdowns in this game as well. And this game was also significant as well because in this game, Bob Greasy actually got hurt in this game, and it was Earl Morrill who then took over for the Dolphins quarterback for most of the rest of the season and did a phenomenal job as we're going to take a look here later in the schedule for the Miami Dolphins here. So after that week five win against San Diego, the Dolphins then played the Buffalo Bills in week six. They won this game 24 to 23 was the score in this game. Miami's backfield, another great game for them. They combined for 223 rushing yards in this game and scored three touchdowns in both Howard Twilley and Paul Warfield also helped out their offense as well with only 74 receiving yards in this game. So kind of like I said, you know, their passing game really wasn't firing on all cylinders. They were more of a run style offense as it showed in their first few games, but they started to kind of turn it up a little bit later in in the season. So the next week after that, though, week seven, the Dolphins play the Baltimore Colts in this game. They won this one by the score of 23 to nothing, shutting out the mighty Baltimore Colts after Shula, of course, left. They, he ended up dominating the Baltimore Colts for the next few years after he left. So in this game, though, Miami's backfield, they ran for 216 combined yards. They scored three touchdowns in this game, and both Howard Twilley and Paul Warfield also were the big receivers in, in this game. They only had 81 yards receiving in that Week 7 shutout over Baltimore. Week 8, the Dolphins went to play the Buffalo Bills in this game. They won 30-16 to in this game. Miami's backfield combined for 241 rushing yards in this game, but Mercury Morris, he had two rushing touchdowns in the game, and Miami's defense forced two interceptions as well against the Buffalo Bills in that game. Week 9, this was perhaps their best performance of the entire season. They won against the Boston Patriots. Final score in this game was 52 to nothing in this game, and this turned out to be perhaps their best passing attack all season long. Both Earl Morrill and the Dolphins had a third string quarterback that year named Jim Del Gazo. They both combined for 307 passing yards in this game and threw three touchdown passes in both Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka. Another great game for them too. They combined for four rushing touchdowns in that week night blowout over the Patriots in that game, setting their setting their sights on a nine and zero record before their week ten game when the Dolphins went to play the Jets in this game. Another close one though. This was a final score of twenty eight to twenty four against the Jets in this one. Both Earl Morrill had 132 yards passing in this game. He had a passing touchdown as well. And Miami's rushing game, another great game as well. Both Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka, they combined for 179 yards rushing in this game. Both And Mercury Morris had two rushing touchdowns and a big Week 10 victory. Week 11, the Dolphins played the St. Louis Cardinals in this game. They won this game by the score of 31 to 10 here, but Earl Morrill had 210 yards passing in this game through two touchdowns, and another good day for Miami's backfield. 194 yards rushing in this game, and Jim Kick had a rushing touchdown in that Week 11 win. Week 12, the Dolphins played the Patriots again. In this one a little bit um, easier game for the Dolphins, but of course it wasn't as big of a blowout as there. One was a couple of weeks before they won this game, though. 37-21 was the score in this one. Earl Morrill had 201 yards passing in this game and threw two touchdowns. Miami's 
backfield, and they also had a few receivers that teamed up in this game. They had 304 total rushing yards in that Week 12 game against the Patriots, and they scored two rushing touchdowns in that game. So rushing attack just phenomenal all season long for Miami. Just no one could really shut them down that whole year. Week 13, the Dolphins went to play the New York Giants in this one. They won 23-13 to against them. Earl Morrill had 171 yards passing in this game and threw a passing touchdown while Miami's backfield, same story, just a phenomenal game for them. 197 yards rushing in this game, and Mercury Morris had a touchdown, putting Miami at a 13-0 mark. And in Week 14, they capped off their 14-0 regular season with a 16-0 win over the Baltimore Colts in this game. Morrill had a least impressive game in this one, only 110 yards passing. He did throw a passing touchdown, though, in both Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka did rush for 157 yards. Don Shula coached the perfect team. He arrived in Miami in 1970 at the age of 40, but he'd already been a head coach in the NFL for seven years, and he'd already lost an NFL championship and Super Bowl III. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. Shula knew perfection would come with a heavy price. The players he inherited in 1970 would soon learn that lesson. Shula had a very keen sense of being in control. When you come into a situation like he came into, where he didn't draft hardly any of the people, I mean, he stepped in with a team that was there. People had been around, people that weren't too much younger than Shula. And as a result of that, he knew that he had to be the single voice. And let there be no mistake, his voice was final. Hold up, hold up, what the hell's wrong with our snap count? Back in a huddle, let's go. What he said was what he meant, and what he meant was the way it was going to be. When Coach Shula first arrived... Let's get something out of the drill. Everything we do is for a reason. We found out real quick there was going to be a change in the culture. With the 12-minute run, four-day practices, meetings until 11 o'clock at night, we were either on the field or in the meeting rooms. Seemed like 16 hours a day. Hardly had enough time to get any sleep. Shula had no mercy on us. We weren't even allowed water on the field. And they complained and, and moaned about it. And then we won our first game. And then we won our second game. Then later in the year, when the players were interviewed, they said that, you know, you know, how did this turnaround come about? And they all said invariably, you know, we worked harder than the other team. We practiced harder. We're out there later and uh, we got more accomplished. In Shula's first year in Miami, the Dolphins won 10 games, seven more than in the previous season. He had a way of getting the most out of you, and I think he did it by getting the most out of himself. We could see how hard he worked. We could see how intense he was. no secret why he was the winningest coach in football. In 1971, Shula led Miami to Super Bowl VI. It was his third title game in eight years, and this time, he planned on being rewarded for all of his hard work. You got it to Miami, you think going to win. I got to. Why? Because all this way for nothing, you know, no sense in losing now. The Dolphins' two-year turnaround did an about-face against the Dallas Cowboys. To this day, it's hard for me to talk about that loss and not get emotional. I'd worked so hard to get there. It, it was just a terrible feeling, just like I'd let the whole world down. It, it, it was, without a doubt, uh, to that point, worst moment of my life. I left there, and I sat on the bumper of a car and just broke down and cried like a baby. Last time I cried was when Yeller died. Lizzie dropped the ball on the snap, and it's recovered by Dallas. To cry over a poor performance is a lot of horse in my mind, but <clears throat> I wanted to get even. Dallas made us look bad that day. Dallas made us look bad because we already made ourselves look bad. 
and I knew that. That served as the launch pad uh, for the undefeated season. Coach Shula, I, I've never seen him quite like he was that day. He just looked at everybody and said, this is not going to happen to us again. When we came back to Miami, they wanted to have a parade for us in downtown Miami. And I refused to have the parade. I said, I don't believe in a parade for losers. I said, hopefully, in the future, we're going to have a parade recognizing us as winners. And we'll be there for that. Yeah, for me, for me, without a doubt, the 72 season did start that evening in New Orleans. You know, when the 72 camp opened, it was a different football team. You could see it in the other players' eyes, in their motions. We all knew why we were there, and, and that was to get back to the Super Bowl and win it. I don't know how many fellows in that 72 team remember this, but at one of the very first meetings that Shula had, when we all came back together in 72, he said our objective this year is to go undefeated. Did he believe that we were going undefeated? No, I don't, I don't think he did, no. But he did say that. And, and I remember sitting in my seat thinking, oh my God, this guy is possessed. He's the devil. The devil and his dolphins should have felt right at home in the 1972 season opener when Miami traveled to sweltering Kansas City for the first game ever at Arrowhead Stadium. And we go in there and it's the hottest game that I've ever coached. I'll never forget that game because uh, I had a white shirt on with my game plan with notes that I made in ink on the game plan in my pocket. And I looked down and the ink was running off the game plan onto my shirt. And I look across the field and the only guy that's got a coat on was Hank Stram. And he's standing there just bearing the heat. Neither the heat nor the Chiefs could slow down the Dolphins. A great reception by Marlon Frisco. In their 20 to 10 win, they followed the pace set by future Hall of Famer Larry Little, number 66. Larry knew how we were affected by the heat, and he didn't want the Kansas City Chiefs to know. So when the third quarter changed and we had that time where we had to go down to the other end of the field, he led our team in a sprint down at the other end. And the Kansas City Chiefs who were thinking that we we're going to tire out in that heat looked and <laughs> saw that happening, and I, and I think that that gave us great uh, motivation and it sort of demoralized them. Miami's offensive linemen were known as the Expendables. All five starters were either cut or traded by another NFL team before finding a home in Miami. Left tackle Wayne Moore was waived by San Francisco. Right tackle Norm Evans was acquired in the expansion draft from Houston. Right guard Larry Little was dealt away by San Diego. Center Jim Langer was cut by Cleveland. But no one traveled a longer, harder road than left guard Bob Kuchenberg, number 67. I'd never played guard in my life until I went to Philadelphia. I got picked in the third round by the Eagles. It was a bunch of uh, older, threatened players who didn't really welcome the, the rookies. So I actually quit. Then I went to the phone booth and called my mother and she said, oh, well, Bobby, you're old enough to, to know what you're doing, uh, but here, tell your brother. No, Mom, no, no, uh, no, no, don't give him the phone. So Rudy got on. He was with the Bears, and he said, oh, you got cut, huh? Well, don't, don't get discouraged. I've been cut before. I said, well, I didn't really get cut. I, uh, I quit. Excuse me? You what? You, you quit. You blankety blank, 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 gutless coward. You're not coming home. So I sat in the phone booth and cried, and then I realized, as miserable as I was in my brief try with the Eagles, um, I was even more miserable on the outside looking in. So I said, I've got to try this one more time. I, 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 I definitely want to play. So I spent the rest of that year in the Chicago Owls uh, of the Continental League. You know, we practiced a couple times a week and uh, played in Chicago's Soldiers Field. There were the wives and maybe the children and the mom or dad. So maybe there were a um, 100 people in the stands, literally, in a 120,000-seat stadium. But it was fun. 
it was a stepping stone to keep me active playing with a plan of making the NFL the following year. So I studied which teams needed offensive guards. Uh, I decided on signing with the Miami Dolphins, this silly new Howard Johnson colored team in Miami, basically because Ed Tuck, who played at Notre Dame, was my backup at Notre Dame, had gone to the Miami Dolphins and made their team. So in the end, I said, you know what, if I can't beat out Ed Tuck, I can't play. <laughs> Kuchenberg, a guard who came off uh, the Sandlots and has done an excellent job for us. He uh, had to win a place on our football team. He did that. And then he had to win a number one starting position. He did that. And he's been playing some steady football for us. It's getting to the point where it's very enjoyable, very fun to know that very likely you're going to go out there and kick somebody's butt. Hands off. Kick through the middle. If you let Larry and, and Jim and myself do what we're supposed to do, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop that. Following a win over the Oilers, the physical demands of football tested fullback Larry Zonka in Minnesota. Usually it's Zonka delivering the hit on the defensive guy. But on this particular play, Roy Winston was there. Roy Winston just about cut him in half at the kidneys. I didn't know Larry, I didn't know if he could get up off the field. You could hear the crack. I thought he'd broke his back or broke some ribs. I know this, every once in a while, when I get out of bed on cold mornings up here in Alaska, I think about Roy. And I hope somewhere out there in South Louisiana that Roy's getting up and I hope he's thinking about me. This week three matchup would be the closest the Dolphins came to losing in 1972. Trailing 14 to six in the fourth quarter, Garo Yepremian hit a 51 yard field goal. The kick is up, he has the distance. It is gone, Garo Yepremian with a vengeance. And with less than two minutes remaining, all pro quarterback Bob Greasy calmly led the Dolphins towards a game winning score. Obviously, you think it's it's down there on the three-yard line. You've got the strongest, biggest uh, bull fullback in, in football. And what do you do? You fake it to him, and you go to the least likely target, Jim Mandich. 14 to 9. Greasy drops the throw. He fires the middle. Wide open. Touchdown. It's Jim Mandich. The Dolphins were about just one thing, and that was winning. Their stars, such as quarterback Bob Greasy and wide receiver Paul Warfield, number 42, put the team first. Warfield combined the speed of an Olympic sprinter and the balance of a Bolshoi dancer. In five seasons with the Dolphins, Warfield averaged 21 yards per reception, a franchise record. I never saw a guy who had as much grace and beauty and just agility uh, uh, as, a, as a pass catcher. And the greatest move I've ever seen was Paul Warfield against Oakland, and he just did a pirouette with just the grace and smoothness of a gazelle and just kept on down the field. And it was something I can see in my mind right now because I've never seen a move like that, even by me. Uh, we're on top of the division, and uh, that's all we're concerned with. And uh, all we all we want to do is get a winning streak going. And the quarterback should uh, be happy with the team performance, and not with individual performances. Bob was not a guy who had to pad his statistics. He was about winning. If we'd have traded Bob Greasy to the Jets in the early '70s in exchange for Joe Namath, we wouldn't have broken 500 because Joe would have been making the sky dark with footballs instead of handing it off to. Uh, Zonka kick and, and Mercury behind Little and Langer. And Bob in New York, if he'd had to throw the ball 40 times, his arm would have fallen off probably. <laughs> Bob Greasy went about his business uh, as a business. And I think that really is the way our entire team handled their, their life. The great thing about the 72 team was that we didn't really care whose number was called. If they called me on a 119, a tight end delay, they did it because they believed the defense would suck up on it and Mandich would come open. He came wide open. That was exactly the right call. We did that 
game in and game out. That's what perfection is all about, is being able to control that kind of emotion that says, I want to be the guy to score. We didn't feel that way. I've never been with a group of men that were more giving in the sense that we didn't care which one of us did it. We just wanted to do it. Zaka and running mate Jim Kick were also winning national attention. The duo became known as Butch and Sundance. They both arrived in Miami in 1968, and they didn't mind sharing the spotlight or the football. But in 1972, the Dolphins had a third running back who wanted to ride alongside them, Mercury Morris, number 22. When I got down to Miami in 1970, and Mercury was a guy with great ability, but he hadn't proven himself as being a dependable running back. Kick was dependable, and, and I went with Jim Kick for a long time as a starter. But then I, I started to realize the great ability of a Mercury Morris and what he added to our offense. So I started to work him in more and more to the offense. And I got to the point where I alternated, uh, depending on the situation, Jim Kick, you know, in passing situations, pass-run situations, and Mercury in run-pass situations. Uh, where, what yard line? I drew in for Kick. And that became, I think, the beginning of situation substitution. It was also the beginning of a very crowded backfield. Now, that could have been a, a situation there where Mercury came in and it all blew up because the media really tried to blow it up. Larry, the game had to be full of mixed emotions for you. Your best friend, Jim Kick, uh, almost didn't get an opportunity to play. Well, Jane, this is a touchy subject at the moment. I don't want to go into it very much. Uh... It's tough for me to say anything because I'm best of friends with Jim and of course I'm good friends with Merck. So anytime I say anything about one, it looks bad for the other. It came to a sudden shock really to me. You know, I've been playing for four years straight and all of a sudden uh, I'm not playing. And uh, I think it was unfair the way it happened. I'm not knocking Mercury because Mercury's a tremendous football player as he proved last year. And uh, I think I'm a good football player. It's just the way it happened really that uh, sort of you know, grapes think, me. Uh, based on what has happened now, especially night that you have earned that starting position well, next I'm, week. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not concerned about that, that that thing about starting, you know, I'm only interested in helping this team get back to the Super Bowl, which is our main starting goal. lineup. Yes, we're going to continue the same way. And, uh, of course, uh, the Jim Kick, Mercury Morris situation, uh, I'll just make that decision right before kickoff, depending on what series uh, we're going to open with. In 1972, Morris had 190 carries, 50 more than in his first three seasons combined. Kick had the fewest carries in his career to that point. Jim, in my opinion, was the guy that had to swallow the biggest lump uh, of pride because he cared more about being on a winning team than whether he was starting or not starting and any of that. The way Jim Kick handled Mercury Morris's situation and Mercury Morris handled the situation and Larry Zonka, the three of us were, were ground zero on that. I thought we handled it with a lot of class. You know, Jim and I were highlighted and spotlighted the year before and Mercury sat in the wings. We got there, we almost got it done, but it didn't work, all right? We lost it all right at the end. So what can we do as a team to get better? Well, maybe putting Mercury in that mix will make the difference. And we all had that appreciation of each other because we understood how it fit together like that, not like that. Don Shula rotated his running backs, but he never had to worry about changing his quarterback until week five. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his, his right ankle, Rick. Uh, it may be right here. He may have to go out of the ball game. When Bob broke his leg in the San Diego game, I can remember Bill Stanfield looking at me, and it's almost like we said it at the same time, because we're in deep <laughs> With Bob Greasy injured, Shula turned to 38-year-old Earl Morrow, who had played for Shula in Baltimore. Morrill had been the losing quarterback in Super Bowl III, but Shula brought him to Miami, even though he was seven years older than the next oldest Dolphin. He was older than some of our coaches, and uh, almost as old as Shula. Danny Dodd, the equipment manager, set a rocking chair up in front of his locker. That was his welcome to the Dolphin locker room. All summer, he toiled in that heat and just did not look very good. I was very confident in Earl's ability 
to know what was going on. He's a very experienced quarterback. Whether physically he could hold up to it, what I was afraid of was when he came out was he was going to be on the next stretcher <laughs> is what I was afraid of. But I didn't know how tough that old bulldog was until he got in the fight. Morrill on the snap. Drops straight back to throw. He sets up. He is firing down in the corner. Warfield. Touchdown. Oh. Earl drops to throw. He sets. He is firing the near side. Fully open. Touchdown. Oh. There's where the experience, the intestinal fortitude come in. That's why they pay the Don Shoulders of the world the big money. That's what a coach gets paid to do. It's to get you to buy it back in again. Now, I mean, he had to sell us on Earl Morrill. And he did. Mid-season, Earl. Okay, babe. I had the confidence that Earl would do it in the pressure of a big ball game, and that's the kind of quarterback Earl was. And when I look back at my coaching career and all the quarterbacks that I've coached, and I've got Hall of Famers and Johnny Unitas, Bob Greasy, and now Dan Marino, you know, Earl Morrill's in my own personal Hall of Fame. Bob Greasy would be gone for months. Earl Morrill was now the quarterback of the NFL's only undefeated team. Chemistry is an integral part of any team effort. The chemistry of that team is a byproduct of the coaching. Pick the one that I think has the best chance of helping us. Don Shula wouldn't keep players around very long that were going to take away from the total team effort. It truly was a big team, little me, and if it was all about big me, you didn't last with Don Shula. Most of the Dolphins understood and accepted Shula's team concept. Eugene Mercury Morris did not. Morris set the all-time NCAA rushing record at West Texas State, so he came to Miami with a big-time reputation and an ego to match. Eugene, for a while, he didn't have his head on exactly uh, straight. And we were on the team bus going from the hotel to the stadium. Mercury gets on with his ghetto blaster, just loud as can be and very distracting. And the last thing I was going to let happen would be to have Mercury invade my mental space with some jive bull****. So that box was going out the window, and it did. <laughs> That's untrue. Totally untrue? Please. Do I seem like a guy that would allow somebody to throw my music box out and not do anything? Please. He knew he was in the wrong. There wasn't much he could do about it. I mean, he's a little guy anyway. People like to have those fables because they're so far from the truth. Well, I played my music, although I'll tell you, in our locker room, it was a, a battle between uh, the Country Western from uh, Howard Twilley and um, Power Jam 99 by me. Uh, he'd turn on the, the Country Western, I'd go back and turn on the Power Jam. You know, it was the black station. He'd go back and turn it on, I'd go back and turn the other one on. Until finally, we listened to Power 99. The Dolphins at that time had the reputation of being a very methodical, business-like football team. And that was the image Coach Shula wanted us to put up front. But underlying that, we were a very rebellious team, a team full of individuals. It was a team with a very strong character, but also with an awful lot of characters. Oh my God almighty! Don Shula's not-so-straight arrows made it a point to express themselves, from the afro-wearing cornerback Curtis Johnson to the bald Cypriot kicker Garrow Upremian. Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? You've been away too long. Shula worked them hard. They took it upon themselves to play hard. When I came out of Utah in 1968, the Dolphins were a relatively new franchise. They were just going into their third season. They hadn't attracted much of a market in Miami. There was a large Latin population, and part of the reason they brought me down there was to help sell tickets. Ed Cogram, here, get your line up! While I am a Spaniard, I don't speak a word of it. Fernandez couldn't speak Spanish, and he could barely see. I probably had the worst eyesight in football. I think my vision was actually 24-25 in one eye and 2400 in the other. 
And uh, while I couldn't see the football well in the air, I didn't really have to to be a defensive lineman. Just look for the blur, chase the blur, catch it, and that's how I played football, sort of by braille. Manny Fernandez, his college coaches at Utah would not even recommend him for the pros. He walked into the Dolphin camp as a free agent. Now he's one of the best in the game. He spins, tries to get the hand off away. Never got the recognition that he, that he really deserved. That lack of recognition made Fernandez a perfect fit with the rest of the Dolphins' defense. No-name defense. Love it, hate it, a uh, little of both. That's a name that was given to us by Tom Landry. He referred to us in an article that was stuck up on our defensive meeting room bulletin board. Uh, just a bunch of no-name guys that uh, I don't know much about, I think was his quote. When the Dolphins won their first AFC title, the defense was called the no-names. But by 1973, that was changing. Nick Bonacotti, number 85, was building a Hall of Fame resume at linebacker. Bill Stanfield, number 84, was recognized as one of the game's top defensive ends. And calling the shots was a gruff, chain-smoking defensive coordinator named Bill Armsbarger. Shula would yell at everybody, but he wouldn't yell at Bill. Bill just look at him, kind of shake his head, and walk away. And they had a relationship that went all the way back to the assistant coaches at Kentucky with Blatton Collier. And so their history went back a long way. Now, the thing they're hitting, come here. The thing they're hitting. Arnsbarger created the 53 defense, named after Bob Matheson, number 53. Arnsbarger kept opponents guessing by using Matheson as a combination linebacker and defensive end. Their Q rating was low. Their IQ, however, was off the charts. In one season, the entire defense made a total of nine mental errors. That says a lot about the intelligence of our team. I think that name has worked two ways for us. In, in many ways, it's hindered some fine individual performances. In another respect, uh, gave us an identity, whether we liked it or not. In 1972, Miami had the NFL's number one ranked defense. But linebacker Nick Bonacanti, number 85, is the only member of the no-names in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. When you go in the Hall of Fame, and when you look at my bust, you're not looking at the bust of Nick Bonacanti. You are looking at the bust of the no-name defense. We could talk about the Purple People Leader, Steel Curtain, all the other great defenses out there, and they can call us no-names. I don't care. We were the best defense in football. That defense and three touchdowns from Mercury Morris helped the Dolphins improve to 9-0. The victory made Don Shula the youngest coach in NFL history to win 100 games. You know, the highlight of the year isn't 100 victories. That's not what I'm looking for. That's a personal thing, and personal things are really insignificant. The thing I want is a team thing, and the height of a team accomplishment is a Super Bowl victory. America turned its attention to the quest for the NFL's first perfect season. Shula addressed it uh, nearly every week, starting from about 8 and 0 on, that we uh, had to make a, an even greater effort to not get caught up in that. Uh, it's impossible not to get caught up in that. Yeah, you know, we'd love to go 14 0. I'd be, uh, you know, mighty proud to be on a team that's 14 0. Don Shula's focus was on redemption, not perfection. The fact that we had a chance to do something that nobody else has ever done still wasn't as important to us as, the, as being able to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. If we were 16-1 and one, and that loss was the Super Bowl loss, that season would have been a failure for us. First down, Dolphins at the Jets' 31-yard line. Earl Despite the talk of a perfect season, the Dolphins' actions spoke louder than their words as their 38-year-old backup quarterback continued to lead them to victories. Which was a good thing, because Don Shula did not tolerate losing. Shula would not let us lose. He was just a miserable SOB when you lost. I don't think that anything good ever comes out of losing. That's my attitude, that's the attitude of our football team. 
and you wouldn't say a word to him, you wouldn't joke, you'd keep your mouth shut, and you'd grind. Take it loose, make mistake, let's go. Don Shula went berserk on the sidelines and would call us everything that uh, you can imagine. He will hunt you down and tell you, make the frickin' play. Hey, Jake! Hey! Get in there, let's go! And often, he wasn't happy after a win. He strove for perfection all the time. All Don Shula's life, he treated a close victory as a loss. We sometimes would get confused. Did we win that game or lose it coming out of meetings on Tuesday? We once beat New England 52 to nothing or something. I don't know what it was. And he even had corrections in that game. I mean, you know, I, he, the guy was obsessed with that. The fact that we won doesn't mean that there weren't the mistakes. There were a lot of mistakes in the ball game. His attention to detail had a psychological impact as well. It pissed you off. But don't you see that whole mechanism is a way to keep you focused. Otherwise, you just gawk in and pat each other on the back, say, good game, and you forget about it. Shula's attention to detail was never more focused than on the practice field, where he specialized in multitasking. Not many men can do this. There's a lot of women in the world can concentrate on five or six things. My mother's one of them, my aunt's a lot. There's a lot of women I meet that can concentrate on multiple things. There's only a few men that I've ever met that can concentrate on more than one or two things at a time. Don Shula's one of them. Charlie, come back toward the ball. He had the ability to stand on a practice field and look around while he's watching everything that's happening in the skeleton passing drill. Good, Paul, way to come back and get it. And managed in between corrections on the skeleton passing drill to holler down and correct something that he saw the offensive lineman do 80 yards away. I, not once did I see this. Many, many times I saw that. If you just let up a little bit in a drill uh, 100 yards away from where he was, you could hear him yelling at you. Pay attention, you know. Say, we only have two hours out here. You gotta, gotta be attention. Gotta be in on this thing, you know. And you wonder how the hell did he see that? In '72, we were so determined to pay attention to detail, to win everything, to prove to ourselves that we could, that we did. Wow. Firing deep down. Following a win in New York, the 13-0 Dolphins went home for the regular season finale against the Colts. For the third straight time, Shula shut out his former team. This is a, a true effort today of 40 people uh, wanting to be the first team in history to win 14 games in a regular season. So we're very proud of this football team. I just wasn't going to dwell on that kind of uh, talk. It was didn't really matter. Going undefeated 14-0 and and losing the first playoff game would have done us a lot of good, wouldn't it? In their first playoff game, the Dolphins did trail the Cleveland Browns late in the fourth quarter. We had gotten so used to somebody coming up with a big play when we needed it that I never really thought about losing the game. It was more a feeling of who's going to do it? Who's going to make it happen? There was always somebody coming in on that white horse. Thankfully, Butch Cassidy Kick was used to riding horseback. The man who swallowed his pride most of the season wasn't about to choke now. They were undefeated and unselfish, as evidenced by the first man to greet kick on the sideline, number 22, Mercury Morris. The Dolphins were headed to the AFC Championship game. Welcome back, everybody, to 100 Years of the NFL, a historical journey. We're going to continue with our look at the 1972 Miami Dolphins postseason schedule now, as well as um, their key offensive statistics for their players during the perfect season of 1972 as well after we were able to see some of their highlights thanks to America's game of the night of the 1972 Miami Dolphins and their terrific work by NFL Films putting that together for me to show you guys that very special episode of their perfect season but let's continue though with the, the 72 Dolphins postseason schedule as you saw right at the very end of 
the America's game about their divisional round playoff game against the Cleveland Browns. Miami won that divisional round game by the score of 20 to 14. It was another really big day for Miami's backfield in this game. They combined for 154 yards rushing in this game. And Jim Kick scored that game-winning touchdown, as you saw there as well. But Miami's defense really stepped up big in this game, too. They had five interceptions in this game and really did a phenomenal job shutting down the Cleveland Browns during, <clears throat> during that game. So really big win, though, for their um, for the Dolphins to get back to the AFC Championship game. This year they played the AFC Championship against the Pittsburgh Steelers in this game. They won this game by the score of 21-17. to Miami's backfield, once again, a phenomenal game for Jim Kick, Mercury Morris, and Larry Zonka. They combined for 156 yards rushing in this game, and Jim Kick scored two of the offensive touchdowns in the game, and Larry Zonka also had the other touchdown in this game was a receiving touchdown off a pass from Earl Morrill in that game as well. And once again, Miami's defense really stepped up again, shutting down Terry Bradshaw, Franco Harris, and those guys. They intercepted Bradshaw twice, and they also sacked Bradshaw two times as well while really limiting the Steelers in that second half to preserve that 21-17 victory, putting them in their second straight Super Bowl in Super Bowl Seven, In Super Bowl Seven, the Miami Dolphins look to capitalize on their perfect season to go 17-0. They play the Washington Redskins in Super Bowl Seven. They won it 14-7 in this game. Once again, Miami's backfield, phenomenal job all season. They continued it in the Super Bowl. Mercury Morris, Larry Zonka, and Jim Kick, they combined for 184 yards rushing in this game, Jim Kick had another rushing touchdown during the postseason. And a little bit interesting here as well, you know, most of the Super Bowl MVPs are mostly offense. This was the first Super Bowl where a really big defensive player really um, stepped up for the Miami Dolphins. Jake Scott, who was a free safety for the Miami Dolphins, and we touched on him earlier in the broadcast. He had two interceptions in that game to earn Super Bowl MVP honors, and there wouldn't be actually another safety to get a Super Bowl MVP for at least 30 years. I, I think the other one was Dexter Jackson for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2002, so only him and Jake Scott are the only two safeties to win Super Bowl MVP honors in the history of the Super Bowl. So, a phenomenal season, though, by the, Miami, by the Miami Dolphins in 1972. Just a terrific job by their coaching staff, their individual players. Phenomenal job on everybody's part. But before um, we show the rest of the America's Game version of the 1972 Dolphins, let's take a quick look at um, some of their key statistics from their individual players as well as some of their defensive players as well that were big parts of the Miami Dolphins during their perfect season in 1972. So let's start out with their offense here. We're going to talk about um, first their um, two quarterbacks that were huge to their success, both Earl Morrill and Bob Greasy. Now, like I said earlier, that the Miami Dolphins, they were more of a run-oriented style of offense. And, of course, their passing game was a little bit weak. It was only 16th ranked in the NFL that year. Well, Earl Morrill and Bob Greasy, they only combined for 1,998 passing yards that whole year. And they also combined to throw 15 touchdown passes and only threw 11 interceptions between them. And they also had a rushing touchdown each during the regular season as well. But, you know, just striking right there you know less than 2,000 combined passing yards between those two quarterbacks it just shows that how the Miami Dolphins were going to win this year just being you know just a time control offense being a running attack and also just help out with their defense but Earl Morrill and Bob Greasy though really good job between the two of them and Earl Morrill as well in this year in 1972 he also received an all pro honor he was not selected to the pro bowl but he was selected as an all pro due to his really good work for the season after bob greasy got hurt in week five earl morrill did a phenomenal job 
for the next nine weeks and even into the postseason a little bit for the Dolphins to really capitalize on their success. So a really good job on their part, as well as the Miami Dolphins' amazing backfield as well. We're going to talk about them now, actually. We're going to talk about Mercury Morris first. He finished with 1,000 rushing yards on the season, and he led the NFL with 12 rushing touchdowns that year. And he also caught 15 balls for 168 yards. And he also served as the Dolphins' primary kick returner that year. He averaged 23.9 yards per kick return on only 14 returns, I believe it was, for Mercury Morris that year. But, you know, as America's game touched on it, you know, Don Shula, he really wanted Morris to take a more advanced role in the offense. And, boy, did he with a 1,000-yard season, as well as his fullback, Larry Zonka, who did a really good job as well during his season. As I was saying earlier, the first 1,000-yard rushing duo in NFL history, Zonka rushed for 1,117 yards that year. He scored six touchdowns, and he also averaged 5.2 yards per carry that year, and he also was selected to the Pro Bowl along with Mercury Morris as well so both them just terrific rushing combination that they had that year and even Jim Kitt got involved as well in that duo a little bit of a lesser role as um, Larry Zonka touched in on America's game they said you know they just wanted to get Mercury Morris more involved in that Jim Kitt though still did a really good job in a reserve role he only rushed for 521 yards that year but he did score five rushing touchdowns and he also caught 21 balls for 147 yards and scored a touchdown for um, the Miami Dolphins during their 1972 season. An interesting note here about um, Jim Kick as well. He was a fifth-round pick, actually, um, in the 1968 NFL draft. He was drafted out of the University of Wyoming that year in 68. So just another really good find by Joe Thomas, really helping set up that really good Miami Dolphins offense for um, their perfect season in 1972. So after their running game, of course, we talked about that. And, you know, as we talked about their passing game, you know, not a big time, you know, electrifying offense that, you know, just scored all these points, even though they were the number one ranked offense. Their wide receivers, not so much big talked about during that 72 season, but they did have some big guys that they really relied on. We talked about Paul Warfield earlier. He only caught 29 passes in 1979 for 606 receiving yards and only scored three touchdowns. And what's going to blow you away is that all those numbers that led the team in all three categories in that um, in that section. So just really... Paul Warfield was really the main guy, but they also had other receivers that really stepped up for them as well. We're going to talk about them now. Actually, Howard Twilley, Marlon Briscoe, um, Otto Stowe, Jim Mandich, and even Marv Fleming as well. All five of them, you know, they were really the rest of Miami Dolphins receiving core that year. They combined for only seven, they combined for 73 catches between them for 1,243 receiving yards and scored 13 touchdowns between the five of them after Paul Warfield, of course, did his part at earning a Pro Bowl honor. Neither of the other five did enough to receive Pro Bowl honors. But we're going to touch a little bit base, though, on um, these guys as well. We're going to just single them out individually. We'll start with actually Howard um, Twilly here. He was a 12th round pick actually by the Miami Dolphins in 1966 from Tulsa that year. And also wide receiver Marlon Briscoe. He also was a little bit of an interesting journeyman receiver as well. He was a 14th round pick by the Denver Broncos in 1968. He signed with the Dolphins in 1972. A lot of people remember this guy though as being one of the first African American quarterbacks of the American Football League, but not only was he a quarterback, he also was used as a wide receiver, and Miami capitalized on that in 1972 after Briscoe had some good years with the Buffalo Bills in between, and that's why Shula picked him up before the 72 season to really help their wide receiving core 
out that year. They're, um, one of their two tight ends, Mark Fleming, here, he was an 11th round pick by the Green Bay Packers in 1963, and then he signed with the Dolphins in 1970, actually. And what's interesting here, actually, about Marv Fleming is actually winning those Super Bowls with um, the Dolphins, and he was also, of course, an NFL champion with the Green Bay Packers as well. He was only one of two tight ends, actually, in NFL history to have four Super Bowl Rings and the other one was Randy Grossman for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1970s. So he really joined a really good class there, even though Fleming and Grossman were not really recognized as being the top tight ends of their times. But still, you know, just being on Super Bowl winning teams and just doing their part that's all what it is about of winning Super Bowl rings between the two of them. We're also going to talk about on their other tight end, Jim Mandage. He was a second round draft pick actually by um, Joe Thomas in 1970. He drafted him from the University of Michigan and Mandich actually finished his career with the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1978 as well. And their last wide receiver, Otto Stowe, another really good um, draft pick by Joe Thomas. He was, their sec he was the Dolphins' second round pick in 1971 from Iowa State. So once again, we talked about Joe Thomas, just a phenomenal job on his part, really doing his work as the Miami Dolphins general manager and really helping out the Dolphins, you know, transform into a championship team, even though they just still needed the right coach to get it done. And once they hired Don Shula and once he implemented that culture change, just the sky was the limit for the Miami Dolphins to reach those two Super Bowls in 72 and 19. 73. And also, we got to give a little bit of love to the Dolphins' offensive line as well. Larry Little, really good year for him. He was an All Pro in 1972, and he also was selected to the Pro Bowl that year. And also, his right tackle, right beside him, Norm Evans, he also received a Pro Bowl honor as well. So that rounds it out for the 72 Dolphins offense. Just terrific job by all the guys that really played a big role for the Dolphins during that perfect season in 1972. But let's talk about a little bit about their defense, though. Actually, their defense had some other really good um, players as well. We're going to start with their defensive line here first. We talked about Bill Stanfill early on really implementing his leadership on the Dolphins' defensive line. He was a, he was a 72 Pro Bowl and All-Pro selection that year for the Miami Dolphins, but they also had another really um, interesting defensive lineman as well. His name was Vern Den Herter. He had an interception in 1972 for the Dolphins that year, and he was a ninth round pick actually in 1971 from Central College, Iowa, so really a phenomenal steal there for Joe Thomas that year in the late rounds, and really good job by um Herter really doing a good job for that Dolphins defensive line in 1972, really helping Stanfill out to really centralize that defensive line unit along with Manny Fernandez, who did a good job during the 72 season as well. We'll talk a little bit about their um, linebackers here, actually. We'll talk about um, Nick Bonacani, of course. He, the Hall of Fame wide linebacker that he was for the Dolphins in the 70s as well as his early years with the Boston Patriots. But he had two other really good linebackers with him as well. There was a left outside linebacker named Doug Swift who was alongside him on the left side. His right outside linebacker was Mike Cullen and all three of them combined for six interceptions during the 72 season for the Dolphins. And interesting notes here about Doug Swift and Mike Cullen. Doug Swift, he was an undrafted free agent from Amherst University in 1970. So another good job there by Joe Thomas finding him. And Mike Cullen, on the other hand, he was a 12th round pick from Auburn University in 1970 as well. So just once again, Joe Thomas doing his part, really doing his general manager duties really, really well, finding these gems wherever they may be. So... Good job by Joe Thomas there. Talk a little bit about their um, secondary unit now, actually. We'll talk about cornerback Curtis Johnson, who 
we touched base a little bit on in America's game. He had the big afro and, of course, really a big-time playmaker, though, for the Dolphins' secondary. He had three interceptions in 1972. He was a fourth-round pick by Joe Thomas in 1970 from the University of Toledo during that draft. Their other cornerback, Tim Foley, he had three interceptions in 72 as well. He was a third-round pick in 1970 from the University of Purdue. So just 1970 draft class was a really good year for the Dolphins to really get their key pieces on offense and defense that year. They also had a, another cornerback who was a third-string cornerback for them, but he was still really impressive for them. Lloyd Mumford was his name. He had four interceptions in 72, and he had and one of them he returned for a touchdown during the regular season. He was a 16th round pick by Joe Thomas in 1969 from Texas Southern that year. So as we said before, just Joe Thomas really doing his work at finding these gems for the Dolphins defense and offense, even though they did not do well during the regular season during those first four years from 66 to 69. He still kept finding gems and even in their 1970 draft class, he set the stage for Shula to do his part with the players that he got for him in his early years. We talked about Jake Scott earlier as well with his Super Bowl MVP, but he also had a really good regular season as well. He had five interceptions during the 72 season, and he was also selected for a Pro Bowl, actually, at the end of the year as well. And we also talked about his strong safety next to him, Dick Anderson. He had three interceptions as well in 1972, and he had a fumble return touchdown during the season as well. And alongside Jake Scott, Dick Anderson, he was also a Pro Bowl selection at the end of the year, and he also received All-Pro as well at the end of the year as well. So just once again, really good job by the Dolphins secondary really doing their part to really help their unit out. And they also had a third-string safety that played a little bit of a big role as well. His name was Charlie Babb. He had an interception during the regular season as well. But in the 72 playoffs, he actually had a big fumble recovery touchdown off a blocked punt in that divisional round game against Cleveland. So he played a big role during the Dolphins' 72 postseason. He ended up being a fifth-round pick, actually, in 1972. So he was a rookie that year, stepping up big time. He was drafted from the University of of Memphis that year in 72. So that does it, though, for um, the Dolphins' defensive unit um, players there. And we'll wrap this up with a look at the Miami Dolphins' special teams here. And we'll talk about Garrow Yepremian here. We talked about how good of a job that he played a big role on the Dolphins' teams. He had a little bit of a, um okay season this year he was a really good kicker in 71 and 73 at a little bit of a better average but he still did his part though for the Dolphins during the season he was 24 of 37 on field goal attempts that year and he made 43 of 45 extra points so he finished finished the season with 115 points scored which was the fourth most in the National Football League that year so a really good job by your premium really doing his work as the Dolphins' primary kicker. And they also had um, an interesting punter as well, even though he did not do as solid as Paul McGuire did and Curly Johnson for the 64 Bills and 68 Jets. Seipel, he only averaged 39.9 yards per punt on 36 punts during the regular season for the Dolphins. He ended up being a seventh-round pick in 1969 from the University of Kentucky that year. But what's interesting though about Seipel though is that he actually began his career as a running back, but then once they had of course Larry Zonka, Mercury Morris, and Jim Kick, once they started getting really loaded with these guys, he needed to find another position and Shula put him in as their punter. And of course he wasn't a big time punter. He didn't really put up the big numbers, but he still played his role as a really good member of the Death 72 Dolphins team. And the last um, player we're going to talk about here, we talked about Morris being their primary um, kick returner. They also had um, a pretty decent punt returner as well. His name was Charlie Lay. He had 22 punt returns for 210 yards during 
the say during the season as well. He was signed by the Miami Dolphins in 1971. He actually began his career with the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1965. Interesting note here, though, about Charlie Lay, though, is that he actually did not attend American College. Actually, he wasn't an immigrant or anything. But what happened was is that after he finished high school, the Pittsburgh Steelers in '65. They offered him a contract actually out of high school, and the commissioner at that time, Pete Rizel, he got wind of it, and he actually, instead of um, saying you can't do that, he actually signed over with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he said, no, you can go ahead and play with the Pittsburgh Steelers as, an, as basically a quote-unquote undrafted free agent, even though he didn't play high school Foot, even though he didn't play college football, but he still is the only player in NFL history actually to not attend American college. He was the first and only NFL player ever signed out of high school. So, you know, trying to see if um, high school kids nowadays, if they want to, um, you know, try and get to the NFL from there, you know, it's not as the days were back in those early in those early to mid 60s you know it's a bit of a different world nowadays you have to attend college at least two two and a half years before you can finally claim your NFL eligibility during the NFL in 1972 home field advantage for the playoffs rotated by division so the unbeaten Dolphins had to travel to Pittsburgh for the AFC championship but on game day, Manny Fernandez's thoughts returned to the Everglades. The headline in the paper uh, read, L-1011 crashes in the Everglades. Well, <laughs> I had gotten married just two weeks before that, and my wife was flying the L-1011. She was a flight attendant for Eastern. I thought she was on that airplane. Call the house, not really expecting to get an answer. The phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and I just sat there like a zombie, not knowing what else to do. Uh, and then finally it answered and it was her. And I got all choked up, obviously. Uh, I still get choked up thinking about it. But, uh, you know, very fortunate she had swapped that flight and the stewardess she had swapped out with survived it, which was a miracle. Very emotional morning for me, and um, then we had to go play the Steelers in Pittsburgh. Back and looking again. One week earlier, the Steelers had beaten the Raiders on a play known as the Immaculate Reception. And there's a collision. It's cut out of the air. Right, go. Harris pulled in the football. I don't even know where it came from. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. The AFC Championship would feature a team that seemed destined to win against a team which refused to lose. Listen, Mr. Mooney, it's good to see you. And, uh, really happy about everything. I wonder what's luck today, but... Well, I understand. In the early going, Pittsburgh's good luck continued. It is recovered by the Steelers, and it's a touchdown. But the Dolphins, like they had done all year, would find a way to win. The surprise hero this time was number 20, punter Larry Seipel. Fourth down, and Larry Seipel is in the punt. Larry Seipel had a green light. Anytime he felt uh, that he could pick up a first down from the punting formation. But if it doesn't work, pretty much it's your ass. You better make it. <laughs> that was my old thought, that you know, you've got the green light, Larry, as long as you make it. Seipel stands back to the Dolphins, 35. Now he's going to run with the ball. 50, 45. 25 and the 20, the 15, and he's out of bounds, out of the 12-yard line. From the game films we'd seen, when they, when they ran a certain return, everybody would hit, and then they would peel to the outside. And as Larry stepped up, he saw him starting to peel, not paying any attention to him. So he just followed him as they peeled to the outside. I remember standing down on the sideline and hearing the Steelers fans screaming, turn around. The defensive line was standing there looking downfield and Stifle ran right by him. Didn't even see him coming. But it was a turning point, a big turning point in that game. Stifle's play set up Miami's first touchdown. Morrill dropping back to throw. He lost one. It is caught by Duncan, the five. But the real turning point might have come at halftime. 
With the score tied and the Dolphins' offense struggling, Don Shula replaced Earl Morrow, who had led the team to 11 straight wins with Bob Greasy. One of the toughest decisions I ever had to make in my coaching career. I looked him in the eye and he looked right back at me. He said, Coach, he said, I don't agree with you. You know, I, you know, I want to go back in, but I respect your decision. That's the kind of guy that he was. Greasy went in and, you know, threw the pass to Warfield. It got us going and gave us that spark that we needed to win the game. Drop back to throw. He ducked up. He fires the middle. Warfield's got it. 35, 40, 45, 50. Started up 40. 35 to 30. He's back down from behind on the Steelers 25 yard line. For the second week in a row, Jim Kick scored the game-winning touchdown. Miami was going back to the Super Bowl. And somehow, the 16-0 Dolphins were three-point underdogs to the Washington Redskins. You know, you hate to hear teams talking about, you know, they're not showing us respect or lack of respect. But after being undefeated and still being the underdog in the, in the ball game, you scratch your head and you wonder, why, you know, why us? Why no respect? You know, what, what have we done wrong? What Don Shula had done wrong was lose two of the previous four Super Bowls. And he was reminded of that often prior to Super Bowl VII. So now I'm sitting there with a reputation of a, of a coach that can win, but he can't win the big game. And you don't ever want to have that said about you if you're in a coaching profession. Shula was particularly edgy because his opponent, Redskin coach George Allen, was the master of football espionage. George Allen would resort to almost anything to find out what the other team was planning. And we were kind of enjoying the week laughing at Shula because he was really paranoid. Shula started getting upset because there were airplanes flying over our practice field. He had tarps up on the, on the chain link fence. All these kids come in and try to get a football sign. Shula's checking IDs. <laughs> it's a midget coach. He's really running a movie camera over there, you know, and things. There was no way he could get to another Super Bowl and lose. Not Don Shula. If you know the man at all, you just know that couldn't happen, wouldn't happen, wasn't going to happen. End of story, and we were going to win that ball game. Let me tell you something. The only thing I miss about football is about five seconds. Five seconds in a huddle, right before you break the huddle and go up to the line of scrimmage. When you have five of the best offensive linemen that are in tune with you, Wayne Moore, Bob Kuchenberg, Jim Langer, Larry Little, and Norm Evans. And I'm looking across at them. This is the game where we're going 17-0. We're putting the final emphasis on a perfect season. Each one of them is looking at me going, run behind me. They're mouthing the words. They're not over. They can't talk in auto because greasy. They're all pointing to themselves going, anything happens, drift to me. And Bob Kuchenberg grabs me by the face mask and says, you better stick your helmet up my ass on this play because we're going in the end zone. When you have people that intent on victory, you got to just marvel. If I could go back for anything, I'd like to go back in a time machine just to, to live those five seconds and looking in the eyes of those men because that was the most confidence I've ever felt in my life about anything. Super Bowl VII, Larry Zonka ran for 112 yards as the NFL's number one ranked offense took a 14 to nothing lead. Miami then focused its number one ranked defense on NFC rushing champion Larry Brown. People thought that we could never shut down our running attack because nobody could. But against the Redskins, Manny so dominated the line of scrimmage that Larry Brown, the great running back from the Redskins, never got to the line of scrimmage. Manny was just too quick for their center. You know, the center tried to block him one-on-one. -on -one. He would throw the center one way or the other and then be in position to make the play. And, you know, I, I had not been blocked one-on-one -on -one. It really much in my whole career, so I thought it was like a vacation there for a while. 
Why'd we play so well? Don't know. Maybe we were that good. For a bunch of no-names, we did okay. Manny Fernandez led the Dolphins with 17 tackles, but safety Jake Scott, who intercepted two passes, was named the game's MVP. The Dolphins had dominated Washington. Now they were dueling with destiny. If we kick the field goal at the end of the ball game, then we win 17 to zip in our 17 and 0 perfect season. The field goal makes it 17 0, 17 0. Well, I don't feel we should have gone for the field goal. I think we should have tried to run it down their throat. The minute that you go after something, figuring that you're going to be 17 to nothing in a 17 0 season, that it's destiny. Destiny kicks you right square in your ass. A 42 yard attempt by your premier. Snaps it down, the kick is blocked. time that comedy of errors was over I really wanted to kill him not because of the kick not because of the pass you know, your friend, he lost his head and tried to throw a pass. but when he didn't have the guts to throw his body at Mike Bass sailing down the sidelines that was just a total lack of character courage just couldn't believe anybody could be that yellow uh, not even Garrow but he, he surprised me. He was even a bigger coward than I thought he was. The perfect score was no longer a possibility. But Don Shula's perfect season was about to become a reality. 45 seconds to go. This can be the last play of the game. This is going to be it. This is it. Come on, stop him this time. Clock run out. Fourth down. Here is Kilmer. Back to throw. He is caught. And he has dropped back at the 17-yard line. That's it. Don Shula, he had lost twice before in the Super Bowl, and now he watches the clock took away as Shula has won his Super Bowl. This is my third time around, and I haven't done too well in my first two Super Bowls, as a lot of people keep reminding me. <laughs> it's been nothing but really frustration, although we've won a lot of football games, and I've been named Coach of the Year. There was always that empty feeling of not really having accomplished the ultimate. And this right here is the ultimate. We stopped them when we had to all day long, made the big turnovers, and just a, a great day for, you know, for me, for, for everybody on the team. It was just a tremendous feeling. I mean, it, was, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Welcome back, everybody, to 100 Years of the NFL, a historical journey. Just before we conclude our broadcast here tonight, I want to be able to tell you all that our next broadcast will be covering the 2016 New England Patriots of the AFC East. But before we also conclude here tonight, though, I do want to pay very special tribute to the 1972 Dolphins' perfect season with one last look at their America's Game film of their 1972 season. And right at the very end, I would also like to take a moment to hear some of the great words of Don Shula at the end of their perfect season in 1972, paying a very special tribute to the greatest man to have ever coached in the history of the National Football League. So once again, as I've said in our previous episodes, you know, if you have an idea or a story you would like for me to look into of your favorite team or anything else for that matter, NFL related, just be sure to put a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube for me to look into the idea, and I will be sure to talk about it later in this video podcast of the 100 years of the NFL. So I hope you have a great night, everyone, and I hope you continue to stay safe during these difficult times, and once again, I would like to pay a very special tribute to Don Shula right at the very end of this video. Have a good night, everyone. They reached out and grabbed a piece of history. 35 years later, they still hold their accomplishment close to their hearts. 
It's the one significant thing that you can continue to guard jealously. Ladies and gentlemen, a standing ovation for the greatest football team ever put together. The fact of the matter is, by going undefeated, we live on. Our ghosts crop up every year when anyone makes it past that 5-0 and o mark, then suddenly the 72 Dolphins ghosts start to appear. And that's a hoot. <laughs> I like being a ghost. <laughs> Don Shula and his 1972 Dolphins traveled a road no one else has taken. The team highlights certainly have to be 17-0, the only team in history, and a special bond has developed with that group of players. They wear this ring with pride. That's a pretty simple ring, but I said it's, it's got something very unique on it. It's the only one that says perfect season on it. And I'll always have this ring right here to remember it by the rest of my life. The money, most of it's gone, but the ring will be here forever. Thanks you for watching this presentation of the National Football League.